Good morning, everyone. My name is Etioni Aldarondo. I'm the executive director of the Melissa Institute for Violence Prevention and Treatment uh, with a home base in Miami, Florida. And uh, for those of you who know us, uh, we don't need much of introduction. Those, for those of you who are new to the Institute, welcome. Uh, the Melissa Institute is, uh, is now going on in its 28th year and uh, uh, with a simple mission to educate and activate uh, agents of violence prevention and treatment. Uh, we've been doing so over the years with uh, trainings, giving signs away, basically, providing trainings and educational materials and uh, to everybody who we think could benefit from it and could do something with that knowledge. So we work with the school systems, with uh, mental health professionals, with parents, with policymakers, and we are blessed to have a, an extraordinary scientific advisory group who give their knowledge away through us. So we we pick their brains and kind of like get uh, get to uh, share their their knowledge with our community. And now through social media and the and Zoom uh, with the world. Uh, over the past couple of years, we have more than sixty thousand people reach out to us uh, in different forms, and you know, and accessing our materials from over one hundred and thirty countries around the world. So we're very excited about the reach and of our work. Everything that the institute does, you should know, is done is for free. So we, uh, our courses are for free. Our materials are for free. Uh, feel free to. Um, check out our resources and our website, and you will get through the, over the course of the meeting today, you will get uh, different links that will lead you in that direction. Uh, all we ask is that you uh, intentionally try to use some of this information to make the world a better place, and that you, you consider uh, when appropriate and if possible in your life to make a donation. Uh, we're a donation-based uh, organization, so, um, any, any, anything that uh, any contribution help us do events like the one that you're about to see today. Uh, so we, we today, I mean, and you know, the topic of today is one of the most timely uh, issues that we could be addressing. Uh, uh, the, today's talk about helping young people develop the skills they need to recognize fake news uh, speaks to, to one of the uh, most important issues uh, uh, that we're dealing with right now, the World uh, Economic Forum has ranked the spread of misinformation as one of the top risks facing the world today. Um, the fake news pandemic and the proliferation of information in recent years has created significant challenges for individuals, communities, and societies. Uh, and we know that fake news impacts our views about diverse topics, uh, such as healthcare and the environment, and can also impact our behavior. Uh, while a lot of research is being done now to understand more clearly the impact of uh, uh, fake news and social media and so on on, on its users, uh, much of the research uh, has focused on adults and it's less known about what really is happening with young people. Uh, and this is a really important gap. Uh, as you know, the, the, a lot of publicity has been given in recent months and in the last, over the last year about the toxic effects and the potentially dangerous impact that uh, social media communication uses and uh, are having in some of our youth. Uh, we're excited today to have uh, uh, Dr. Yvonne Skipper to discuss uh, the current literature and interventions which can be used to support young people in developing skills to spot fake news and make informed decisions. You should know, and as, as an aside, that we are now, this is the beginning of what we consider to be one of the most important initiatives that the Institute has embarked on. We, we are creating now what we call the Social Media Safety and Mental Health Initiative. Uh, a, a, a core component of which is the work that you'll be learning about to, today from Dr. Yvonne Skipper. And uh, as you hear more about this, and, and if you are 
uh, interested to have your school or the school or your kids go, uh, um, learn more about this way of doing things and preparing and educating your kids um, and work with us at the Institute to implement some of these initiatives, please reach out. We'd like to hear from you and uh, serve as technical support and assistant to you in getting this going at your institution. And now let me just introduce you to Dr. Yvonne Skeeper. And uh, Dr. Skeeper is a senior lecturer in psychology based in the School of Education at the University of Glasgow. Uh, she has published more than 30 articles and book chapters on edu educational psychology. She has expertise in working with partner, organi with partner organizations such as local education authorities, schools, and charities to co-create interventions to improve educational outcomes. As you will see in those, some of the information that we have about her in, in her bio, she's an award-winning scholar and uh, in, in uh, all of this in, in, uh, in, 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 as a, while continue to look extraordinarily young and, uh, and uh, which I don't know exactly uh, how to explain, but uh, uh, we are, we're very, very fortunate to have her with us. Um, we're, we're also grateful to our scientific uh, advisor, uh, Dr. Deborah, Deborah Pepler, for uh, bringing uh, Yvonne's work to our attention and being so gracious to introduce her, introduce her to us. Uh, we fell in love with her work and with her immediately, and, uh, and can't wait now to share with you. And I'll leave you now with Dr. Yvonne Skipper. Thank you so much, Etienne. Thank you for inviting me to come and present to you, and thank you to all of you who've come along today. Um, and many thanks to Christina, who's backstage and doing all the things that make these things work. I have to say, that was a lovely introduction. Um, <laughs> I really enjoyed that. I've got my, my picture of Dorian Gray hiding to, to stop me from aging. So. Thank you so much. Um, what I'm going to do today is I've got some slides which I'm going to share with you. Um, and I would like to ask you to put your thoughts in the chat as we're going along. So I've got some um, things that I'm going to be asking you to do to, for example, let me know your thoughts and who you are and where you're coming from, um, et cetera. So what I would like to start with is asking you if you're able to introduce yourself in the chat. So what your name is, uh, your role and where you are in the world today. And if you're able to do that while I'm talking here, I'll do a short introduction to myself as well. And then we know a little bit more about who's in the room and what people are um, what people are looking for today. Oh, look, already people coming through from Florida. Someone's saying the chat is disabled. Sorry, Kate, we'll try and get that sorted for you. Um, OK, so. Um, I'm Dr. Von Skipper. I'm a senior lecturer based in the School of Education at the University of Glasgow, which you can see behind me. Um, this is our main building. It's uh, looking quite a lot like Hogwarts. So quite often on graduation days, you'll see the students coming in with broomsticks and jumping up and down and taking photographs. It's our freshers week this week. So the students have just come here from all over the country. It's very busy. Um, all the restaurants are full of students all, all settling in and, and, and getting, getting themselves organised. So it's a really nice time at the moment. But of course, because it is Glasgow, it is in fact raining, as it always is. So it is a very grey day today, but the students are, are bringing the energy. So as I said, I work at the University of Glasgow. I've been here for a couple of years now. And that's our main building. You can see on the left-hand side there, it's a lovely, lovely old building. I am not in that building. That is where the, uh, the business school is because they make the most money. Our building is well down the road in an old teaching college and doesn't look anything like that. But this is the, uh, the official party line for the University of Glasgow. I'm a senior lecturer and I teach um, developmental educational psychology. And alongside that, um, I research um, all sorts of different topics basically around education and psychology. Um, one of the projects which I run is called Whitewater Writers, um, which you can see a picture of the children here. And what we do in that is we ask our uh, groups of young people to collaboratively write and publish a full length book in a week. So you can see those children there. They planned their book on Monday. They wrote it on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. They proofread it Friday. They designed the cover, the blurb. No adult touched the key. All of our books are available to buy on Amazon. Um, and then a couple of weeks later, we do a book signing event and all their friends and family come and they tell you who's going to be in the movie adaptation. So this is one of my great passions is taking things we know in psychology about how people learn, about how to motivate people, about how to raise aspirations and bring that all together to create something that creates real world change. So that is what gets me most excited in psychology is how we can take all these things we know and, and use them in the real world. 
um, to make a real world impact, which is one of the reasons I'm so excited to be working with the Melissa Institute, because I know that's your passion as well, is taking these things, these abstract things, working with practice and creating things that create real world change. So that project, we've worked with more than 3000 kids. Um, we've worked in prisons, we've worked in all sorts of different settings, and it's just been an absolute delight. Um, and lastly, the last picture here is of Loch Lomond. Glasgow is about 40 minutes by car from Loch Lomond. And when I'm not working, I like to be up there and hiking and enjoying our lovely scenery um, when it's not raining, but often it is. And uh, a little picture of a Highland cow there. Just gonna have a quick look in the chat and see, gosh, people are from all over the place. It's great to see you. Thank you for coming along. Excellent. Okay, so let's get started. In terms of the aims for this session, our aims are to understand what fake news is. Some of you might have heard the term fake news, but it might not be something that you are aware of, you know, what the official party line is on fake news. To think about the impact that it can have on our beliefs and our behaviours. Um, to be able to identify fake news yourself with greater confidence, so you're better prepared, hopefully, to um, identify fake news. And to also think about interventions you can use with your own children, with children you're teaching it, um, teaching all these different groups to help them develop their skills in recognizing fake news. So the first thing I want to ask you to think about, and um, you're welcome to put your thoughts in the chat as well, if you like, or just to reflect a little bit, because I think it's always good, you know, you're, we're all busy people and quite often we come to these things and I, I've done it myself. I come and I sit down, I'm like, what am I doing? Quickly scrolling back through my notes. Um, so I want you to have a little think about yourself. Like, have you come across fake news? How did you know it was fake? What was it that, that set the alarm bells ringing? Like, what was it that made you think this isn't real? Was it something about the, the picture that was with it? Was it something about the headline you didn't buy? You know, what was it that made you think um, that this was or wasn't real? And also whether you think we should worry about fake news. Is it just one of those things? You know, it's always been around, it's not new. You know, fake news has been about since the beginning of time. People have been telling each other things that aren't true. Or there's been rumors just that now we've got the internet, these things can spread much more quickly. So is it something that we should be worrying about? Or do you think it's, you know, it's people getting a little bit hyped up about something that's not actually too concerning? So you're welcome to put your thoughts in the chat if you'd like, or to just reflect for a minute on what your thoughts are about fake news, some examples of fake news that you've perhaps seen. Moving on to some definitions. So this is the academic literature now, what they say about fake news and, and missing disinformation. So there's two different, well, two main thoughts um, about missing disinformation. So misinformation and disinformation are often used interchangeably, um, but actually they are slightly different. So typically when we're talking about misinformation, we're talking about false or inaccurate information. So where you get the facts wrong. So you've forgotten something, you've misread something, you don't know that it's wrong, you believe it's right, um, but you, you've just kind of misunderstood what you've been told or, or you've accidentally, you know, Put a, put a zero on the end of something and made it, you know, 100% instead of 10% or something like that. So it's false or inaccurate information. Whereas disinformation is where people are actively trying to cause problems. So this is where you actually are trying to say something that's not true. You're saying something about a group that you know isn't true. You're trying to say someone said something that you know they didn't say. So you're actively trying to kind of start that rumor or say something negative about other people. So of course, these two things do get interrelated because someone could set could share disinformation with me and then I could share it, but I believe it's true. So the line between these two things is a little bit blurry, but there's the kind of idea of the motivation behind it. Is it an honest mistake or is it somebody who's actively trying to cause problems? Um, and actually this morning when I was reading um, the, the Guardian newspaper, there was an article in there saying that we need to do a bit more, um, that, sorry, not we, um, that social media uh, providers need to do more about missing disinformation uh, coming up with the elections. A lot of countries have elections this year. We've got one in the UK. Um, you know, there's lots of different um, ones, uh, elections coming up and missing disinformation is spreading very quickly. So they've, they've said that's something that, you know, we need to be thinking about on, um, at, the, at the level of these um, social media providers. And so we've got missing disinformation and fake news itself is intentionally fabricated articles that are verifiably false and could mislead the audience. So someone could make an article um, saying that um, uh, Greta Thunberg said something that she didn't say. So you've actually actively done it. So that's kind of that disinformation side of things. But then, of course, people might believe it and share it as misinformation. And this sort of thing is really important because, you know, it, it has been suggested that it's one of the most uh, important risks facing the world today. 
if we don't have this good information, how do we make good decisions? You know, how do we know what's real and not real? Or do we get to the stage where we just don't trust anything anymore because there's so much mis and disinformation out there and the line between them isn't always clear. We don't know if someone's done it on purpose. Some people say they didn't realize they've made a mistake, but they've actually not made a mistake. They know full well that what they're sharing is wrong. So there's lots of kind of blurred lines in this, um, in this field. So there's also been some discussion about the fake news being a pandemic, a new pandemic that we're in, because it affects lots of different things about us. It affects our views on lots of topics. And some of these don't really matter. You know, if you see something about a celebrity saying they're going to release a new album um, and they're not, you know, that's not really going to change the world. It might change the world if you missed out on your Taylor Swift tickets because you got your date wrong. Um, but some of these things are, you know, relatively small fry, but some of these are really big, you know, what's happening to our environment, climate change, um, our healthcare behaviours, you know, whether we should um, take certain steps um, to protect our health. So it's not just, you know, these little things, it's really, really big topics, really kind of life changing stuff that there's lots of fake news about. Um, and it's not just our beliefs, they change, they, they impact our behaviours too, they impact the things we do. So it's not just the things that sit in our head like, oh, I believe that this person said this. It affects the decisions that we then make about our own health care, about our behaviours. So that's where it becomes really important that we understand fake news. And it's something that is said to be un to undermine science, democracy and society. So, of course, we need accurate information about science, um, you know, and scientists and the things they're saying. And this is something that we come across quite a lot, I guess, in the UK, but also in the US, where scientists were taught to be very careful in the way we say things and use a lot of qualifiers and sometimes this and sometimes that and of course the press want a kind of nice pithy um, statement and and so sometimes they take these things out of context so it can be a misinformation example where they've taken something that we've said and, and used it out of context um, that happened to me incidentally at the beginning of the pandemic when uh, the schools in the UK were shutting down and there was a lot of anxiety among parents about what's going to happen to my child. They're going to be out of school for such a long time. It's going to be a real problem. You know, how am I, how am I going to, you know, they're going to be the lost generations. This is the very beginning of the pandemic. And they asked me to come on to the radio and to talk about some of the psychology of, of these things. So I, you know, I went on and I was trying to be very encouraging because at that point we didn't know what was going to happen. Um, and I was saying things like, you know, there's things that families can do, spending time together, you know, learning in a fun way, playing games. Um, you know, these are all things we can do to help our children to maintain their learning and, and their social relationships with others. I was very careful in the way I spoke. And the next day there was um, a headline in a slightly um, dubious newspaper that says, said, no negative impact of COVID on children's learning, says psychologist. And that was me. And I was so shocked. I never said anything like that. All I was saying was there were things that we could do to help our children to be learning during these things. So, you know, this is a really important topic. It's something that, you know, we really need to be thinking about is, is kind of real and fake and, and trusting and also, you know, taking things out of context and these things that can be done as well that takes true information, but swings it around so it becomes disinformation as well. So the first thing I'd like to ask you to do is to take part in a very short quiz just for fun um, to see how much you know about fake news and what you think about fake news. So, Christina, are you able to share that? Oh, great. Excellent. OK, so um, there's a few questions. And the first question I want you to ask, uh, sorry, to answer is if you were to rank yourself on your personal ability to recognize fake news, where would that be? Are you in the top 50 percent of people? Are you in the top 25 percent? Are you in the top 5 percent or the top 1 percent? So I'll give you a second to think about where you would be in terms of your ability to recognize fake news, your personal ability. Okay, so it looks like most people are saying they're in the top 50% of people, um, but nobody thinks they're in the top 1% of the population. Some, some people are saying they're in top 5%. Um, obviously, I'm not testing you guys on your individual ability to recognize fake news here. Um, and I'm interested to see your answers because there is uh, data to suggest that um, only uh, a very small percentage of us can ac accurately do this. So I think people have been quite honest. It's another one of those topics where everybody thinks they're a slightly better driver than everybody else. So I think you've all been quite, quite, quite careful there. Um, most people saying they're in the top 50% of the population, which is probably about right. Some people saying they're in the top 5%, you know, that could be correct. But most of us tend to think we're better at it than we are, which is part of the problem, right? Because if I think I'm already amazing at this, 
then we don't engage in different things to help us to get better at it. So that's something to think about. There's not a correct answer here. I'm just interested to see what you said. So about 70% of people are saying they're in the top 50%. Okay, can we have the second question, please, Christina? Okay, sorry, which of the following statements is true? True news spreads quicker than fake news. Fake news and true news spread around the same speed. Fake news spreads two times faster than the truth or fake news spreads six times faster than the truth. So what do you think? Is true news spreading quicker? Is fake news spreading quicker? Great, so it looks like most of you have participated now, still a couple of people coming in. So the correct answer is that fake news spreads six times quicker than the truth. Fake news spreads a lot quicker than the truth, typically because it's more interesting. So as you will know, recently the Queen died in the UK and there was all sorts of fake news about that, which spread quite quickly um, because it tends to be a bit more interesting with all these conspiracy theories and ideas around it rather than just an older woman is, has died. You know, she's, she was you know, very old. That's not terribly exciting news, but the fake news where there's all these kind of conspiracy theories and stories around it, that tends to spread a little bit quicker. So there we go. Fake news is spreading six times quicker than the truth. Next question, please, Christina. Approximately how often do people believe fake news? Do you think it's 10% of the time, 25% of the time, 75% of the time, or 90% of the time? So we're all believing that people believe it a good chunk of the time. So the correct answer here is 75% of the time. So most of you got that right. Um, we tend to believe, we're quite likely to believe fake news. All of us do fall prey to it at times, um, and we are quite likely to believe it when we do see it. Uh, can we have the next question, please? What percentage of people can systematically accurately tell true from fake news? What percentage of people can systematically accurately tell true from fake news? 4%, 10%, 50%, or 75%? Okay. That's 65% of people. Oh, hang on, now we're at nearly 70 now. Yep, so the truth of the matter is that only 4% of us can systematically accurately tell the truth from fake news. So it's a real, it's a very small number of people who can systematically do this. Most of us get it right sometimes, but not always. Um, but there is a small number of people who are particularly good at it. Okay, next question, please. How many seconds of audio recording of your voice would be needed to create an audio clip of you saying something, perhaps that you would never say in your life? The correct answer is three seconds. You now only need three seconds of audio of your voice to make it there, to make an audio clip of you saying pretty much anything that, that they want you to say. I did have a, a, a voice modulator installed. Um, I was gonna actually change my voice at this point and make myself sound like somebody else, but apparently it was coming through quite crackly. Um, though I did have some fun with it because I accidentally, when I was trying it, left it on and went into some meetings with my students and apparently I sounded like the godfather. <laughs> I was scaring them a little bit in my, uh, my approach. So, um, yeah, only three seconds. So, you know, it is possible, for example, if I had um, recorded Tioni's voice, I could come through and I could be speaking and you could see my lips moving, but you would hear his voice coming through. OK, next question, please. What percentage of Twitter users are exposed to fake news? I guess it should be called X now, but what percentage of people on Twitter are exposed to fake news? And you can see here that, yes, most of you are right. 70% of people on Twitter are seeing fake news. So we know that social media is an absolute beast for sharing fake news. Um, and we also know that because of the algorithms, once we click on a fake news story, we see more evidence and more news about that fake news story, and it pulls us into that. that so. Fake news is a, a real problem on um, on most social media sites. I've used Twitter as an example, but it's very similar um, stat statistics on Facebook as well. Um, thank you, Christina. Is there another question? Yeah, yes. Fake news has been shown to impact how people voted in the 2016 general election. OK, so the correct answer is true. 100 percent of you got that right. Yes, we know that fake news has impacted how people voted. So this shows that it isn't just something that's affecting, you know, little bits and pieces. It's something that's affecting our, our societies, the things that are happening for us um, and, you know, the decisions that our governments are making. So it's a really important thing that we we get on board with that and that we try and think about ways that we can help ourselves and our kids to recognize fake news. So um, hopefully that's whetted your appetite and, and got you thinking a little bit about fake news and real news and, and, and how good you might be at spotting fake news. So I'm going to move on now to talk a little bit about the impacts of fake news. 
So some of you might have seen this picture of the Pope recently. This is fake. This is not real, but I think it's a pretty good fake photo. Um, and it's quite funny too. So there is some some elements of fake news which can be quite amusing. You know, we know that April Fool's Day is a big thing every year. Um, you know, people make up fake stories and share them around. And, you know, people sometimes have a lot of fun with fake photos and fake videos. You know, you can make things happen that are quite funny and amusing. Um, so there are like, you know, there's benefits to fake news. It's not always evil things. Sometimes it can be quite fun. A lot of people are actually fooled by this photo of the Pope. So it ended up going viral here. It was in all the newspapers. Um, I, you know, I think I think it's a pretty good fake, actually. The only thing uh, with fake photos, sometimes they have problems with fingers um, getting better, but typically fingers are where they have issues. So that's a good place to look. If you can't see hands, it might be a suggestion that it's a fake photo. So fake news is something that can be entertaining. It's something we tend to enjoy, um, but it's also a problem um, because it impacts a lot of different things about us. So for example, we need accurate information to make informed decisions. We can't decide if we want a uh, uh, to buy a certain thing, to vote for a certain person, to trust a certain person um, without good information. So that information is so important for us in terms of, you know, helping us to understand, um, you know, to make a good decision. And obviously fake news can destroy credibility of, of a person, you know, fake news goes around about a certain person. It can make people think, well, they're not a trustworthy person. I don't want to vote for them. I don't want them teaching my child. I don't want um, to allow you know, this to move forward. So it's important in that it's destroying potentially our credibility. Um, it can create confusion and misunderstandings about important issues. So if someone says something and then there's a bit of fake news and then it says they didn't say that or they said this, but only in this situation, it can be really confusing um, and can cause a lot of misunderstandings um, about anything really, about all these different topics. So it's really important that we understand or that we, we get better at spotting it. And I think someone said this in the chat as well, that it can create a kind of fake news panic where people are like, you just can't trust anybody these days. So I have to make my own decisions, um, which is fine. But you need information to make those decisions. And sometimes when that happens, people move away from those sort of mainstream sources. Um, for example, investigative journalism, which does find out, you know, the truth and sometimes, you know, not very nice things about certain people. Um, and into kind of keyboard warriors who maybe are, are just saying things without any evidence. So we don't want to get to the stage where people don't trust anything. We just want to get to a kind of stage of healthy skepticism where people are understanding, you know, the issues. Um, they understand, um, you know, who might be saying it, why they might be saying it, where to look for information about who's saying it, you know, how to look for fake photos, for example. Um, so, yeah, as I was saying, it tends to make us value good journalism less. We tend to pull back and just think, well, you just can't trust anybody these days. So, you know, and when you do that, the world becomes a very scary place. I don't know who I can trust. I don't know, you know, if she's really said this. I don't know if I should, you know, get my child this medical treatment, for example. So it can be really tr tricky to think about, you know, how we create healthy skepticism, but don't go so far that people just think, well, I just can't trust anybody or any information. And it's also people's biggest worry online. I thought this was quite interesting. So you can see here a survey of people of all different ages. Um, and you can see here that the number one issue that people were worried about, so more than 50% in all age groups was false information online. And of course that might be about different things, you know, like, you know, younger people might be worried about false information about different topics, but generally we're all a bit concerned about fake information online. Um, second biggest worry here, of course, is online fraud. Um, that's increased in the UK. I think I was speaking to Police Scotland the other day and online extortion is up, uh, I think it was 324% since, um, since the COVID pandemic. So, you know, that's another worry that people have. And then much lower down is online bullying. And this is interesting, you know, for me, because I thought this would be something that people would be more concerned about. But generally, people are very concerned about fake information. So fake news can be quite dangerous because it affects our behaviors, opinions, and choices. It can fuel political polarization. So if we start to believe fake news about a certain group, we might be like, right there, the bad guys, we're the good guys. And then we kind of end up in this kind of stream of going this way, you know, we can't trust them. It's just us. We can only trust our own information. We don't see the other side. And of course, social media algorithms make this happen even more because once we start looking at things and clicking things, you know, our algorithms go, okay, so she, she's into this, she believes this, and then we see more and more of it and it pushes us down that route. So we don't then even see some, even see the arguments the other side are having. It can threaten democracy, as I was saying, there's discussions about this um, in terms of what the social media 
um, platforms should be doing to help to, to you know, reduce these threats to democracy. So it's not just at an individual level, but at the level of, um, of the platforms. And it's interesting as well, because some of the work we've been doing with young people, they say, oh yeah, Facebook, it's Facebook's job to do that. Facebook will check if people are sharing real or fake news. Um, and of course, sometimes, you know, there will be things that would take down, but it would typically be more content related rather than true or fake news. And as we said before, it fact impacts our voting behaviours and impacts our health behaviours as well. So hopefully that's got you kind of thinking that there are some issues around fake news and it's something that we need to be concerned about. So I'm now going to turn a little bit more into the psychology of fake news um, and how we process things and how we think about information and why that might impact why we believe fake news. So this is a model of information processing, which you might have come across, and it's called the systematic heuristic model of processing. Basically, there's two different routes for you to process information when you get it. The first route is your systematic route. So if you are making a decision about buying a new car, you're probably going to use this route. This is something that matters to you. So you're probably going to go and read some reviews. You'll probably go on maybe which car. You might speak to friends and family. You're going to go and do some proper deep research. You might go and look at the safety ratings for it. You might go and, and, and find different websites. You might speak to, you know, if it's somebody who you knows really into cars, you might go and have a chat with them. Hey, you know, do you think it's safe to get a Toyota? So this is the sort of the route we use when something really matters to us. We use systematic, we think about it, we get the different bits of information, we pull them all together, we analyze it and we make a decision. That's our systematic route. The heuristic route is when we're not really paying much attention. So you probably wouldn't make a, buy a car just by kind of, you know, just being like, oh yeah, probably that one. But you might decide what, what candy bar to, to have or, you know, something like that. When you, if you're not really thinking, use this heuristic route. And when we use heuristics, we're not using deep information, we're using shortcuts. So things like, oh, well, um, you know, I trust Yvonne and she says that this is a good candy bar, so I'll get the same as her. Or, you know, uh, this, this article was written by a doctor, so I trust doctors, so I'm going to trust the article. So systematic is where we take all the information, we process it and we think about it. Heuristic is where we kind of, um, we don't really pay a lot of attention, we just use rules of thumb. Um, we tend to make use that for like less important decisions. And when you're sitting on Facebook and you're scrolling, you're just kind of flicking through, you're probably not using your systematic um, route, you're kind of in your social time or your downtime, you're probably just letting it kind of wash over you. So you're not really paying full attention, so you might use heuristics. Oh, Yvonne shared that, you know, she is usually trustworthy, she's a psychologist, she shared this article on psychology, I can trust that. Um, and so the problem with that is that when we're not really paying attention, when we're just kind of scrolling, we tend to be more likely to use that heuristic route and therefore we, we believe fake news more because we're not really paying attention. We use these rules of thumb and then we think, oh, yeah, you know, Yvonne said that or I saw it on social media. Um, I trust the people on my social media stream. And so we're more likely to be fooled by fake news. So how can we get people to think about news a bit more? Well, one kind of theory, one idea that people have used is the idea of an inoculation. Um, so, for example, the idea here is that fake news is spreading like a virus. So, you know, somebody sees it, they pass it to someone else, they pass it to someone else. And so the, uh, the image that people use here in the field is the idea of an inoculation. So you get an inoculation against fake news. And the thing with this is like, like a typical inoculation is it has to be very specific. So if I wanted to um, uh, help somebody to, to inoculate them against fake news about climate change, I might give them some facts about climate change. So they would have those facts at their, at their disposal. And then when they're scrolling, they might read something and think, oh, hang on a sec. I'm pretty sure that when I read this thing by this trustworthy source, it said this. So, you know, I don't believe that. So that's one way in which we can help people to spot fake news is to inoculate them, to give them the real, the true facts. Um, and then they can use those when they're making decisions. So that might help us to, to use the systematic route. It does help to um, reduce fake, belief in fake news. But the problem with that is if I inoculate you with information about climate change, that's not necessarily gonna help you with information about, you know, um, about uh, other topics. So for example, healthcare. So the problem with that is it's fine for a certain topic. You could inoculate your kids with, you know, um, facts about any topic that you, you worried about them seeing online. But then when they come across another topic, they don't have the skills necessarily. And if they've not got those facts, they might be sucked in by those. 
So this sort of thing is domain specific and it's not scalable. It's not easy for us to, to do this and you know, it'd be hard to get hold of everybody and be like, here's 10 facts about climate change, pay attention to them and then you can go off and do your scrolling. It's not really something that we can easily do um, on a broad scale. So another thing that you might have seen, I've seen a few of these recently, is warnings about fake news. So telling people there might be misinformation on this page. Um, I've seen it on Twitter or X a few times recently. Um, I don't know if you've seen it, it kind of pops up and it says this might not be true because there is evidence about blah, blah, blah. Um, so you can warn people, you know, this, this page might have some information on it that isn't true. Um, and doing that tends to make people more likely to spot misinformation and less likely to share it because they're, they're ready, they're primed. And this is because when people tell us stuff, so according to Grice, this is an old piece of research, but there are kind of maxims of communication. And one of these is what you tell me is going to be true. So we assume the default assumption is that people are going to tell us the truth. Um, of course, they don't always, but that tends to be the, where people start from is you are telling me the truth as you know it. Um, and those little warnings just remind you that maybe, you know, certain things in here might not be truthful. It might be a mistake. It might be that misinformation or might be disinformation. And again, this makes us kind of stop instead of just using those heuristics, kind of pause for a second and go, does that make sense? You know, have I read anything else about that? You know, has, has, have I seen this on other websites? Um, and this is kind of true because when we've seen a warning, people look at information a lot longer. Um, so we take more time to process it. So it could be that these warnings might be enough to help us um, to spot misinformation. But of course, if we have this on every single website, if every website you goes on, you go on has a big thing at the top saying, warning, there may be misinformation here. You're not gonna pay attention to it. Um, you're gonna scroll right past it. And the same way you do with all those adverts and videos um, that are on various websites, you almost, I mean, you are paying attention, but you're not really because you're kind of scrolling straight past that to the article you're interested in. Um, so sometimes these warnings are posted about true news. This is a kind of sneaky way of um, helping people to, um, to, to put this information in about uh, true news, even when it's it's true, people put warnings that it's false. And of course, if we do too many of these, people just stop believing it. So warnings aren't gonna be enough um, to do this. So what else can we do? I read this study, I thought it was really interesting, which is why I wanted to share it with you. And what's interesting in this study is it suggests that once you learn a fact, it's really hard to replace it. Once you've learned something, it's in your head and you're like, yep, this is the truth. It's very hard to then change it. And quite often you can't even remember where you learned it. So what they did in this really nice study was they had people read 12 messages about a fire. So, you know, there were 12 kind of separate messages saying the fire started at this time. It was discovered by this person. It happened in this room. It spread to this room, you know, et cetera. So there were 12 different messages. And some of the participants read a message that wasn't true. So it said, in one of the rooms, there was uh, gas cylinders stored in that room, and they were the reason why the fire blew up so quickly. And then later on, there was a, a, another message that said, actually, on further investigation, the police found that there were no gas cylinders in the room. It wasn't true. So they read all the information, they had an incorrect thing, and then they had a correction again at the end. And what they did after the participants had read all of these messages is they asked questions about the content. So when was the fire department called? So something very literal you could see in the message. An inferred question. So what could have caused the explosions? They have to judge based on the information they had. Nobody, you know, there was not a direct cause of it. And then asked if they could remember the correction. So what was the point of the message from the police? And that was the message that said that there hadn't been gas cylinders in there. So a literal question, inference question, you know, what can you infer from the information? And then whether you even remember seeing that corrected information. And what I thought was really interesting about this was that the participants said, yep, yeah, the, those gas cylinders were not there. They knew that, they told you, yep, yeah, I can remember that, that wasn't true. Those gas cylinders weren't in there. They had nothing to do with the fire. But when they were asked that inference question, what caused it, they were quite often saying things like gas cylinders. So they knew that there were no gas cylinders, but they were like, maybe they were in another room or maybe something else had happened. So they're kind of using these, this, you know, it's in there somewhere, even though it's not kind of at the front of the head, they know that it's not true and yet it's still in there. And we see this sort of thing really commonly, like I, I presume you see this in your families and in, in your kids as well. Like the other day, my partner was chatting and he said to me, I read an article about this and it said, blah, blah, blah. And I said, an article, really? And he thought about it for a while and then he went back onto his search history. And he was like, oh, it was on board Panda. 
<laughs> no, yeah, that's not the most, um, you know, up to date source of information. So we've got to be really careful about this encoding of information because once it's in there, we don't remember usually where we've heard it. Like, oh, someone told me this. That could have been your teacher. It could have been your pal. Like, you know, there's there's very different, um, you know, levels of expertise there. So quite often we forget the source of the information. And once the thing's in there, it's really hard to get it back out. You know, we see this a lot with corrections of scientific articles. You know, people will come back and say, I made a mistake with the data or I falsified the data. But once people believe something, it's really hard to get them to change that belief, um, which is obviously why disinformation is so great, because once it's in people's minds, it's really hard to, to get it back out again. So all of these things I've been talking about so far have been cognitive. They've been about like your memory and how you think and how you process information. But fake news isn't just to do with um, cognition and thoughts. It's to do with motivation, like why you want to. There's a motivation. There's a reason why we share fake news. Um, it's not just, you know, because of the way we think. We have, we have good, good reason to sometimes to share fake news. And there's some suggestion that when fake news is related to sacred values, we share it more. So what this means is if you have a sacred value, let's say your sacred value is freedom of speech, and you think this is the most important thing, and everybody should always be allowed freedom of speech, and it's, you can't compromise on that. Like, regardless, that is the number one thing for you. Um, then you are more likely to share that fake news. Whereas if you have, like, let's say you believe in freedom of speech, it's important to you, but maybe other things would take precedence, like the safety of others or, or something else. You might have some negotiation around that. So you're less likely to share fake news when it's um, to do with these sorts of non-sacred values. When it's something that's really important to you, you're more likely to share fake news about it even when you've got fact checks, even when you've got accuracy nudges, even when you've got warnings, you are more, all of us are more likely to share fake news when it's to do with something that's close to our heart and something that really matters to us. So that could be to do with processing, but actually the suggestion is it's not to do with that. It's more to do with the fact that it helps us to feel part of a group. So, you know, if we're part of a group and we believe, you know, as a community that, you know, freedom of speech is really important, and you know, that's the most important thing. Um, we are more likely to share fake news about it. So what they did in this study is they measured your brain activity using fMRI. And there's parts of your brain which are involved in making you feel like you're part of a group. Um, and when you are sharing fake news about sacred values, that part of your brain is active. So you're not just acting as Yvonne, you're acting as Yvonne, the group member, Yvonne, who is part of this team and we believe these things. So when we're sharing fake news, it's not just to do with our thoughts, it's to show that we're part of a group. You know, we found this article, we're sharing it with our, with our friends, with people who think like us, and it helps us to feel like a community. And then obviously the algorithms get involved and then we kind of find more and more fake news on these things. So, it's, it, you know, we are motivated to share this news because it's a way of kind of maybe it's fake news that, um, you know, is, is about something that we think is true. You know, if we believe something and then we find fake news that supports that, we're, we're likely to be, oh yeah, that's clearly true. I already know that. So I don't need to go and check it because I know that this is, this is true. So this is the idea that it's not just about the way we think, it's the fact that there's a, a group element to this fake news, you know, that we want to be part of um, communities and that those communities share news and then they create kind of little bubbles of fake news together. So, while there's a lot of information on adults and fake news, all the things I've been talking about so far have been to do with, do with adults, typically over 18s, um, quite often university students, because they are very accessible for us to do psychology studies on. There's a lot less research on young people and fake news. And this is a problem um, because it has been suggested that digital media literacy should be a pillar of education. We know that kids are getting most of their information online. Kids are not sitting down to watch the news typically. Um, they're getting their news kind of second or third hand quite often through Facebook, um, not Facebook, sorry, through TikTok um, and through other kind of social media sites, YouTube, for example. Um, and the kids are actually worse than adults in terms of the skills needed to assess whether news is true. So only 2% of them can systematically do this. And 60% of them are saying that they don't trust the news now because there's so much fake news they don't know what's real and what isn't. So it just feels like a bit of an impossible task for them. And so there has been a little bit of research on this. Um, and what they did was they looked at what people were, what young people were doing in terms of real and fake news. And they got them to look at some websites and say whether they were real or fake. And what's interesting here is that 
there was a website about climate change and the website was run by the fossil fuel industry and a very small percentage of kids had looked at the kind of the um, website address to see who had written the information. So of course, that's one of the first things we can do is see who has written this article. You know, we can then guess what, whether they might be pro or con a certain topic. So even a, a very small percentage of kids were even looking at that to see who might have written the article. Um, more than 50% believed a misleading video, supposedly showing ballot stuffing in a US election. It was actually a Russian video. Um, and they tend to take things at kind of face value and trust, which of course is part of being a young person. You believe that the people around you are telling you the truth. You believe your teachers, you hopefully believe your parents most of the time, that's how we learn. But of course, plenty of people on the internet are not telling the truth. So they tend to take people at face value. Um, and very few of them are actually cross-checking um, things. So very few of them are kind of finding a new source and going, oh, I wonder if that's true. I'll go and look on another website. Quite often they see the one website. Yep, that's it, that's true. I'm going to trust it and I'm going to, to share it myself. And this was interesting to me as well, um, was that um, we found this in our work too. A lot of kids didn't think about credibility of sources um, on social media. They didn't really care too much about whether it was true or accurate, but what they really wanted to be was to be the first person to share it. So the, the, the thing they wanted was to be unique, to be the first person to share a piece of news. Um, and they didn't really think about how damaging it could be to share fake news um, about a person. So they were more interested in being the first one on the block to find this you know, funky news story or to share this TikTok video than they were about whether it was true or not. So again, this is a bit concerning because um, you know, kids are, are struggling with you know, the sort of very basic checks that we could maybe do um, to check if something's real or not. And they're more interested in um, uniqueness than they are about the, the truth of the things they're sharing um, and this is kind of interesting to me that you know it's it's more important to be to be cool and to be first than to, to be true so the other thing I wanted to touch on just before I move on here is that a lot of kids think they're better at, at recognizing fake news than adults um, than than others um, like like adults they think they're better than others but also they think that their technological skills make them better so, for example, they think because they know what Photoshop is or they know what um, they know what Photoshop is or they know what um, other techniques, voice mod, for example, the thing I was going to use to change my voice, they think they're less likely to be fooled. But while they have that technological knowledge, they don't have that so much kind of maybe interpersonal knowledge or kind of that that thing that maybe adults have a little bit more of kind of that sort of healthy skepticism about who people are and, and saying who they, they are, who they say they are. So sometimes that sort of digital native thing can help because you know these techniques, but sometimes perhaps it can hinder because you, you are a truthful person. You might believe that other pe people in your network are also truthful. So how can we teach skills to help young people recognize fake news? Here's some examples of, of things which have been used before. Uh, for example, you could ask your students to find a piece of disinformation and write a paper on how they know not to trust it. So find, find something that's not true. Find that picture of the Pope um, and explain how you know not to trust it. What did they do? Where did they look? How did they know it was real or not real? You could ask um, students to post examples of misinformation or disinformation on a Teams or a Slack channel. So it could be something that you look at, um, you know, every every week and see what kind of true and fake information there is and how people are finding true and false information. Um, or another suggestion was to ask students to track their media consumption throughout the day and produce a reflection on where they get their news, what they believe and why. So if they did want to find out something about a particular topic, where are they looking? How do they know that's trustworthy? Who are they following? Who are the influencers that they're following? Are those influencers trustworthy? What websites are they using? Another suggestion is to get students to do some lateral reading. Um, and this is again, a really simple way all of us can use to find out if something's real or not. So instead of just clicking share straight away, we can go onto another website. There's a lot of factchecker.org, things like that, where you can just go and check, you know, is this real, is this not? And students rarely do this. Uh, most of the time they see it on whatever website is their website of choice. Adults don't do it that often either, I will say. Um, but just being taught to do this can increase them, uh, their likelihood to do it. And then that can help them to catch fake news or to catch the sort of nuances sometimes. Yes, that's true, but only in this situation or only for this group, for example. And there is another example here. It's called the fake news game, which I came across. Um, and it's 
it's a game which you can play it's for adults um but i think young people could use it to older young people probably kind of top end of secondary school and in this players learn about six common misinformation techniques so things like impersonating people online there's plenty of um, twitter uh, handles which actually aren't real but look pretty real um, using emotional language, uh, group polarization. So, you know, we do this, they do that. Spreading conspiracy theories, discrediting opponents and trolling. And it gets them to learn about those techniques and then create their own fake news in these different top uh, and different topics and help get them to uh, try and spot real and fake news that their colleagues have made. And there is some preliminary evidence in this game that improving that it improves skills in recognizing fake news. I've got some links at the end of this talk to some of these websites. So if you're interested in trying some of these techniques, then you can do that. So I'd like to ask you now, I've been talking for a little while, um, what techniques you might have used to teach these skills in your, in your kids, in your young people. So, you know, what have you tried already? Um, what else might you need or what else would help you to teach these? Um, what is missing from existing materials? So how have you tried to teach these skills? Have the students been responsive? Have they not liked it? Have they liked it? Um, and what might be helpful to you in terms of teaching these skills? That's great. Thank you. Um, I've just been looking through the chat um, and there's some good. I've, I've seen the questions as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to come to those at the end. Um, some really great questions there. But in terms of some of the things people have been putting in, um, in terms of how they've been teaching. Um, they've talked, Diana was talking about asking people to check the source. So see who has said something, which is a really nice, quite simple way of just that first step of who, who said this and what, what reason might they have for saying it. Um, Holly made an interesting point about how fake news might impact your social position. So I, as I was saying, you know, this idea of maybe, uh, you know, have being the first person to find this cool bit of fake news uh, or news, you maybe don't believe it's fake, you know, gives you social standing to be the first person to share this cool TikTok video in your in your group. So I think there is a social position element to being, you know, the first one to find things. So maybe that that drive might be something that stops you from pausing too long because you're like, oh, well, if I go and do some research and things, maybe someone else will share it first. And I want to be, you know, the one to bring this to my social group. So I think there's some um, interesting yes, ideas there in terms of our, um, you know, your social position. Um, and Diana was also talking about us versus them arguments. So trying to, as soon as you see that, you know, someone's trying to persuade you um, to, to, to believe something. Usually if we're doing us versus them, it's usually us who are the good guys, right? Um, <laughs> so even something as simple as that. Um, as soon as you see that might be a warning to even if it's true to just kind of pause for a second, think about the emotional language, think about why someone might be um, presenting that to you. And I noticed, um, Michael, you put something in the chat and the Q&A, so I'll come back to this as well. But this idea of AI and fake news. Um, and yes, definitely, it's something we need to be exploring now, because um, I don't know if how many of you have played on chat GPT, but it's very good. Um, it, uh, it can produce all sorts of things very easily with a decent prompt. All you need to do is kind of tell it what to do and it will write you an article. Um, it'll also put in academic references that don't exist right now. It can't reference, but it'll still put in Skipper 2022 said, da 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 da, um, and then put a reference at the end to an article that doesn't exist. Um, so it looks very legitimate, but of course it's not. So there is a slight issue there in terms of, well, not a slight, a big issue in terms of producing articles that look very legitimate and seem like they're accurately referenced, but aren't. So I think AI is something that's going to be a real problem, um, you know, moving forward with fake news because it allows people to write articles that sound, you know, you can tell it what tone to, to do things in as well. So you can tell it to use a formal tone, write it for children. I will admit to you, I use it sometimes for social media posts. If you put in a, an article abstract and then say, write me three social media posts, it'll do that for you. I check them first, but I do use it. So um, people might be using it for slightly more nefarious purposes as well. So let's uh, move on. So I'd like now to share with you um, a project which we've been working on uh, to help kids to recognize fake news. So one of the things we came across when we were looking through all of this stuff is that most of these interventions have been designed for adults. So, you know, a lot of the techniques are, are designed for adults. And the ones that have been designed for young people have quite often been designed by adults for kids. And we know that sometimes this works, but sometimes it doesn't. You know, kids themselves have a very clear idea about what they want in things. And, you know, we are not always necessarily up on the most recent 
um, terminology, the most recent websites. I will say since I've done this research, I've started to feel a lot older. I thought I was quite up on these things and uh, I, it turns out I'm really not. Um, so we wanted to design them in partnership with the young people themselves. So it would be something that they would recognize, they would value. And the other thing we noticed is that a lot of the interventions exist are on a specific topic. So they're like focused on this one thing. And for us, we were like, well, we don't really want to focus on that one thing, that issue with inoculation, because just because we've taught them about climate change fake news doesn't mean they'll be any better prepared for this other sort of fake news. So we wanted to be much more skills based um, and we wanted to work with and for young people. So we wanted to focus on kids because, of course, kids are a captive audience. They're in school anyway, so we can get them easily. Getting hold of adults to do these things is harder. Um, and then we can tie it in with other things they're doing. They're learning about sources in history. You know, they're using the same techniques in this. They're, they're learning about, um, you know, some of these issues about trust and information in modern studies or IT or things. So we can kind of tie it into things they're doing naturally in school as well. And the main thing that we wanted to do here was to co-create the intervention. So this is where partners, academic and um, uh, charities or, or schools or young people, anybody are working together to design solutions to real world problems. And this is something I'm really passionate about because I think there's plenty of academics who sit in their ivory tower and they've got the elbow pads on the, the jackets and they think that you know they know better and they design these interventions and they go into schools and they deliver them um, and then they test them and they evaluate them and they go, yeah, this is great, it's really working. And then they leave and then they put all those things behind a paywall and then teachers are like, well, actually, you know, we don't have that time. It's not going to fit in the curriculum. We don't have these resources. And then they never get used. So by working together from the beginning, what is the issue? How can we design it in a way that's going to work with your, your school, with your kids and actually the kids themselves? You know, what do you want? You know, what, what's going to be fun for you? What are you going to listen to? We don't want the kids sitting there like, oh, miss, this is really boring. We want them really engaged. So that's why we decided we wanted to co-create an intervention and it was going to be about fake news, misinformation, disinformation. And we left it very open. We didn't have a clue what the kids were going to create. We worked with them. We worked with teachers. We worked with social media influencers um, and we all worked together to design this intervention. And the reason why we brought in the social media influencers was because we know that kids don't always trust people in authority. They certainly do not trust Dr. Skipper to have expertise in their online lives. I will say when we were in the middle of the co-creation, uh, one of the kids said to, they were talking about trust online and they started talking about e-boy. And I thought they meant eBay. And I said, oh yes, you've got to be very careful when you buy things online, people might not be telling you the truth. And uh, one of the kids said to me, uh, miss, it's like an internet subculture. <laughs> so that made me feel like I needed to get my Zimmer frame out. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was quite embarrassing. So they don't trust you know, teachers and academics, but they trust um, people who they perceive as being similar to them. So we wanted to get influencers on board. You know, the kids trust these influencers. They follow them every day. They know these influencers quite well. They start to believe that they have a friendship. It's one way, but they start to believe it. They're like, oh, Molly's going to hate that. You know, Molly never, never drinks that. Oh my gosh, I can't believe Molly was the first one at the party. She hates that. She always likes to be the last one. They really have this sort of connection with them. So we're like, let's use that. Let's let's see how we can get you know these influencers involved and young people involved as well. So they're hearing messages and they're hearing um, you know the activities from other young people. So we worked with three different schools in the city of Glasgow, and we had eighteen young people aged about thirteen working with us. We had three teachers, five influencers. You can see them here. They're so cool. Um, I'm I'm no longer cool, and four academics. And we all worked together over six weeks to create materials um, and we said to the kids, what do you want? We didn't go in with any plans. We, you know, we were like, you can design a game, you can design, you know, slides, you can do videos, you can do activities, like whatever you want, whatever you think people need to engage with this. Um, we don't mind, it's your, your thing. But we brought some of the academic things about processing, about, um, you know, techniques, about what other literature showed that worked. So we brought those in and the kids brought in what they wanted and the influencers brought in their expertise as well. So you can see three of our influencers here. Um, and we used the share checklist, which is something that's used in the UK. It was suggested by the UK government and the kids wanted to use this as their, um, their um, what's the word, foundation um, for it. So they created six hour long sessions and these are designed for young people aged 11 to 13. It's delivered by teachers, um, but there are lesson plans with embedded videos and activities. The kids liked videos, 
and they didn't want to listen to their teachers they wanted to listen to the influencers and the teachers quite like that too because then they you know they didn't have to prepare a lot of stuff and all the materials are freely available online you can check them out you can use them please use them um, and these are the topics that they're on so they're on fake news fake photos uh, fake people which is who do you trust online you know which profiles can you trust fake stories, which is conspiracy theories, um, fake videos, and the last one is keeping it real, which brings all those things together and asks them to design um, uh, materials for, for other young people. So we wanted it to be very easy to use. We didn't want to give our teachers a big encyclopedia. Um, it's very quick. Um, all of the slides are available, and then they've just got a couple of lines underneath, and it, it says what you need to run the lessons. But it's all very simple to use, um, and it's a lot of discussion questions, a lot of videos, and a lot of interactive activity, which the kids wanted. So you can see our, oh, look, I'm wearing the same T-shirt. I should have thought about that. Um, you can see our website here, projectreal.co.uk. Um, please feel free to go on it. You can download all the lessons. Please use them. Um, yeah, please check it out. And this is the share checklist, which is used in the UK, um, the UK government suggests. So it's quite an easy acronym to remember. So S is for source, who wrote the story, why might they have written it, check the about section, check who, you know, whether they are who they say they are. Headline is don't just read the headline, actually read the article because you get these pithy kind of headlines sometimes and then there's a lot more nuance. So sometimes the article's nothing to do with the headline. So read beyond the headline, um, analyze, check the facts. Just because you've seen it a few times doesn't make it true. Go on fact checking websites, you know, see if you can backtrack an image, you can back search to see where an image has come from, for example. Retouched, look to see if the image might have been manipulated. So for example, when people, um, uh, for example, when people uh, edit their waistline, you quite often see a wavy line behind them where they've maybe forgotten to edit the thing behind them. Um, so look for judders, for example, in videos and errors. So look for fake um, lookalike URLs, look for spelling mistakes, um, bad grammar, etc. So this is what was the foundation of all these different things. And then they went through and they designed these materials based on these kind of checklists. So I'm going to ask you to have a go at trying some of our materials for yourself. And these were designed by the kids um, so you can see how good you are. So I've got two new stories here and I'm going to ask you if they are real or fake. How did you know and what did you look for to see if it was real or fake? So here's our first one. This is from a uh, newspaper called the Metro.co.uk. Curious story of the man who tried to mail himself to Wales from Australia after getting homesick. So do you think this is real or no real? Give you a little second to think about it. This story is true. A guy actually did get homesick and he couldn't afford the plane ticket, so he decided he was just gonna mail himself home. The Metro is a newspaper in the UK, um, which is, I mean, it's typically funny, um, but typically quite trustworthy. Here's another one, Canadian lawmaker caught naked during video conference. And William Amos, who has represented the Quebec district of Pontiac since 2015, appeared on the screens of his fellow lawmakers completely naked on Wednesday. Um, and this is from uh, the Huffington Post. So what do you think? Is this real or no real? This one is actually real as well. Apparently he came home from the gym and this was during COVID, during the Zoom era, and he forgot that he'd left his camera on and was actually completely naked during a video conference. Um, this one didn't go as viral as the one did. Do you remember the, the guy who was in court and he put a filter on and he was like a fluffy bear? <laughs> um, so yeah, these are two examples. And what, what we did is we gave these to the kids and the kids could go and, and have a little, do a little bit of research and see if they could find out if these were real or fake. So that's the example of fake news. So now we're gonna try some fake photos to see how good you are at spotting real and fake photos. So here is our first one. Is this photo real? This is the gates of heaven in Bali. Do you think that this photo is real or no real? Let me tell you the answer. This photo is not real at all. This is what the gates of heaven in Bali look like, this middle picture here. You can see there is no water at all. And what they do is they hold a mirror in front of your camera and that makes it look like this beautiful reflective thing. There is actually not even any water there at all. So when we talk about these photos, we talk about, you know, how kids, how people might feel. They go all that way to see this beautiful sight and actually it doesn't look anything like that in real life. And what that might feel like, you know, to go to the other side of the world and see something and realize actually it doesn't look the way you wanted it to. So there's a lot of kind of discussion questions that come along with these sorts of things. 
Um, here's another one. This is one from our, one of our social media influencers, Bushra. Do you think that she edited this photo? This photo has been edited. So on the left, you can see her original photo. You can see it's a lot darker and she's edited it to brighten it up. She's got rid of all the people in the background. So she's the only person shopping. She's added a few more trees and a few more baubles. Again, not particularly upsetting, um, but you might be a bit upset if you turned up at this shopping gallery and expected it to look a certain way and it didn't. Um, but we talked about why she might have edited it and she talks about you know, why she edits some of her photos and not others and that she will edit backgrounds, which for example, she wouldn't edit her face. That's one of her kind of things that she will do. Here's a professional one. This is a Jennifer Lawrence photo. Most of you probably have seen her. Do you think this photo has been edited? The answer here is no. So you can see here she's been edited. Um, so they've actually pulled in her waist. They've uh, shaped her, her hips, for example, and they've darkened her cheekbones and things like that. So again, through this, we can have discussions with the kids about editing photos. Is it okay to do that when it changes your appearance? How might it make people feel to do that? Why some people might edit, why some people might not. Um, and the kids get to have a little go at playing with some of these photo editing bits of software as well. So there's a couple of fake photos for you. Now we're gonna try some fake videos. I'm going to play some videos and I want you to tell me if you think they are real or fake. And you can tell me what you think. So here's our first video. Guck dir das dumm an. Du kannst da drin. Steht einfach die Ender. Sie laufen. Sie laufen, wenn grün ist. Oh, ist das geil. So you can think, do you think that this is a real video of ducks or is this a fake video? If you said fake, you are right. This is not real. This is uh, used for German road safety. It's a road safety campaign. And you might be able to guess that because the ducks look a little bit robotic. The feet are kind of a little bit odd. It's also not terribly likely that, uh, that ducks would stop at a crossroad, but it was done in a sort of comedic way to get people thinking a little bit about, um, about uh, road safety. So it's a German road safety campaign. Um, so if you were to go and Google this, we let the kids go and do that. They can find the video. They find that it's a German road safety campaign. They look for the duck's feet. Um, and these are the other things that we ask them to think about. Okay, and one more video here. See if you think this is real or no real. Evan, there's been a lot of changes this off season for your team. How do you feel your chances are in the ALEs? Um, I mean, I love our chances. You know, it's been... Uh, it's been... Oh, there you go. Dad, keep it on the field. Oh, there you go. Dad, keep it on the field. Real or no real? And the answer here is fake. If you do a little bit of research, you can find that it is a, it has been uh, it's actually done for an advert. Um, it's fake. It's not realistic necessarily. If you were to analyze, um, you know, thinking that he would know it was coming, there's a bit of juddering in the video, so that we might suggest that that might let us know the stands are empty. Um, also, it would hurt quite a lot to catch a, a ball going at that speed in your bare hand without a mitt. So um, these are some examples of some of the materials which the kids designed. And then we have discussions about what it might, why people might edit these things, why they might create them, what to look for. And the children themselves get to um, get to have a go at finding, you know, real and fake videos themselves. So these are all examples of actual materials which the kids have designed for us, which is really exciting. So in terms of those activities, did you find them easy or difficult? Um, which one was the easiest and which one was the hardest? And did you expect it to be easier to spot fake news? So these are the sorts of questions we ask the kids um, and the kids have group discussions and then they design things and they come back together to, to create, um, to share their thoughts and to uh, sometimes create real and fake news themselves and just to reflect a little bit on it. Also, I've done this as a, as a competition where I've done it online and I've done parents versus kids and we've we've shown them some of these materials and we've had parents versus kids to see who's better and i will say that quite often the kids are pretty good at it um in terms of particularly the photoshop and the video editing whereas the parents tend to be better at the uh 
the real and fake news stories and the real and fake people. So there does seem to be a slight difference in that, but it's quite a fun um, way to do it because we wanted this to be very gamified. We didn't want people to feel stupid if they couldn't spot things. We wanted them to feel safe in having discussions. So a lot of it is, you know, just getting them to think, to use these things, to go and look on the internet, to find out information and um, to see if they think these things are real or no real, for example. So that was Project Real, and now I'd like to just share with you a little bit of um, data which we collected on this project. So what we did was we co-created these materials with kids, influencers, and teachers and academics. And we wanted to see if participants would, well, we hoped that they would get more confident in their ability to recognize fake news. So we know that people have this sort of fear of, oh, is it real or not? Everything's just fake, I'm rubbish at it. So we wanted them to be more confident in recognizing fake news. We wanted them to get better at recognizing fake news. So we wanted to look at, you know, what it was um, that made them, whether they could recognize fake news better. And then we also wanted uh, to see what they would do with, with news they got. So would they make more checks before they shared the news? So would they go and check the source? Would they do this, that and the other before they went through? So we got um, a bunch of schools in the city to do this. It was interesting because we had to get opt-in consent um, because of the ethical approval we received for this. Um, so even though we had, I think something like six or 700 kids do the, uh, do the thing, actually we, we, uh, we only had 126 uh, kids do the, um, the evaluation because we had to get our active consent for this. And I don't know what it's like in the US, but getting parents to return letters in the UK is very challenging, even for things like free school trips. So it was a much smaller sample, even though we know there was a lot of appetite for this, we, we put it out to schools and they were biting our hands off literally um, to, to take these materials and to utilize them. And we had kids aged from 11 to 13, which is the beginning of secondary school in the UK. So they just transitioned at 11 um, up to 13, which is when they start studying for the um, like national exams and as well as doing questionnaires we did some focus groups and we spoke to the kids in small groups and asked them a bit about the materials what we could do to improve them whether they liked them or not and we we did some interviews with teachers as well so we went individually and spoke to teachers from the schools and asked them a bit about how the intervention was working for them so some of the things we looked at were whether confidence like did they feel that they were able to recognize real and fake news uh, we also looked at their ability to identify fake news. So we gave them some examples of headlines and asked them how confident, uh, how accurate and trustworthy the news was and whether they were confident in their, their assertions. And then we looked at the checks they would make before sharing a fake news story. And then for the interviews, we basically were asking, you know, what were their impressions of Project Real? And what we found is we increased confidence in recognizing fake news, which is good. They, they didn't have that sort of feeling of, I can't trust anything. They believed that they were better at it. And they made more checks um, from the beginning to the first and second time. So they're more likely to check things before they shared stuff. Great. That's what we wanted. Um, and it was particularly powerful for the kids who used to make no checks. They used to just click share. They were much more likely to make, make changes um, in that and check more. But we didn't see uh, big changes in their ability to recognize fake news. And the reason for this, I'm pretty sure, is we could see it happening. Um, but because we only had a very short period of time to do the questionnaires, we couldn't let the kids um, loose to go and do all the bits of research they've been doing through the things. So they had to make the judgment call then and there because we only had a very short period of time um, to, to run the questionnaire. So we're rerunning this now with... Um, a larger group of pupils and with a better measure of fake uh, fake news where they're going to be able to go and do the research. So that was, I think, a measurement issue, something we just didn't have control over because of the time in which we did, we did this. Um, because the schools just didn't have the capacity to give us like, you know, a slightly longer period for the kids to, to go and do the research and, and use those skills they developed. So we also looked at this qualitative data to see what um, participants thought. Um, so you can see on the um, on the left, we've got what the kids thought and on the right what the teachers thought um, so we've got things like uh, I now know how to identify fake news before I was before I didn't um, and I could genuinely see the the light bulb moments so the teachers are saying this um, light bulb moments when they were chatting about things and they were understanding it the kids thought it was interesting um, and the teachers thought it was important because we chat about it at times but now you're providing an expert view on it increase their confidence, um, it made me more confident in myself, I know what to do now, 
made them more aware of things around them and confident using them, especially when using fake profiles and accepting information from someone, uh, sorry, invitations from someone that might be fake. And they really like the co-creation, which is really good for me because this is something I believe in. So it's nice that they believed in that too, that they liked having the social media influencers and they help because they know more about it. They know why it's good and bad in some places. So they like that sort of balanced um, view. But it's not like, oh, all social media is rubbish. You know, these people are influencers. A lot of kids want to be influencers. They liked hearing from Harriet. Um, Phoebe talked about a time when she ran a, a competition and somebody um, copied her profile and then got all the information from her followers. And we talked a lot about that. You know, when, when you are a, 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 on social media, you are kind of influencing and people are trusting you. So you have a responsibility to your followers. And that was how the influencers talked about it. And that really resonated with the young people that, those people are following my channel, so they trust me. So it's my job to make sure that I'm not sharing nonsense with them. Um, and the teacher said that too, the videos from the influencers was really good to relate it to the real world when it's an aspiring career. And the teachers also said it was easy to use. They loved having the videos and links and things like that. So for me, that was great. We didn't want to give people more problems. We wanted to give people solutions. And again, I think that co-creation really helped with that because they were able to work together. Um, and to create something that's hopefully more useful. So we're currently rerunning this study in, in Glasgow again, um, with different measures of ability to recognize fake news with a larger sample of kids. We've also edited the, um, the materials a little bit, like we've shortened certain sections and, we've, um, and we've, we've added like some little bits just based on the feedback that we got. And we're also really interested in developing something further, you know, maybe looking at different topics or looking at different groups maybe with younger people, for example, we've currently been working with, you know, early, teen, early teens. Um, so we'd be interested in working with young people um, and with our different partners. So the Melissa Institute, Police Scotland, we've been talking to about helping people develop those skills um, and Young Scott, which is a charity um, in the UK, which um, is focused on helping young people in Scotland. Um, and they have a really good digital comms team um, who are really good at designing videos and things like that. And they talk a lot about, you know, safety online. And I also think it'd be interesting to look at who is more susceptible to fake news. Like, what is it that makes certain people maybe more likely? Who are these top two, four percent of people? What is it about them that makes them so good at these sorts of things? So I'd be interested in exploring maybe who's susceptible to fake news or maybe when they're more susceptible to fake news. So, for example, some work I've been doing with Dr. Daniel Jolly, we've looked at conspiracy beliefs in kids. Um, we developed the first ever measure of conspiracy belief in children and we see a kind of increase in conspiracy belief to about the age of 14 and then it decreases again so there's clearly something happening around about that age so maybe it'd be interesting to look at how different ages are responding to fake news when we're better at spotting different types of fake news um maybe when there's different things going on in our society you know how that might have affected things this was done kind of during the pandemic so that might have affected kids being more interested in fake news because they were at home um, and they were on their own. So this was the only place they were getting information. So these are some of the things I'm interested in exploring more, but I'd be happy to hear from you if you've got any um, ideas yourself about how these things could move forward. So basically the implications of this are that teacher-led interventions can enhance people's confidence and their behaviors in terms of fake news. And these sorts of interventions like Project Real are very scalable they fit into school content, so they don't require you taking hours out of your school day to do it. The, the teachers delivered these in what we call in the UK personal social and health education, uh, which is a kind of catch all for doing things like health education, sex education, citizenship education. It tends to be, you know, there's kind of a few hours a week where there's a bit of freedom in the curriculum. So a lot of teachers used it then. Some people, teachers used it in um, history and some teachers used it in IT sessions. So it's something that they could drop into different sections. Um, and to me, it's really important that you don't require time out of the curriculum to deliver it because I don't know what it's like in the USA, but here it's very tight in the curriculum. There's not lots of time to add these extra things in, but they are important, of course. Um, and what's interesting to us as well is this is a, a small academic website. This isn't hosted by the University of Glasgow. We've had more than 40,000 hits on our website um, from across the globe including a lot of a lot of people in Ukraine. Um, of course, fake news has been a big part of the war in Ukraine. So it's interesting how people have been picking this up and utilizing it. So as I said, it's free. 
please do use it um, with your, your young people or if you've got any thoughts, I'd be really, really happy to hear them. And also for me, it's important to think about the fact that these co-created interventions might be particularly effective. I think if I had designed this on my own, sitting in my, my lab, it wouldn't have looked like this. Um, it wouldn't have had something, the kids named it. <laughs> they designed the logo. Um, you know, a lot of the, the, the games and the activities probably wouldn't have been as fun. I might not, I wouldn't have chosen those topics necessarily. So for me to see how the kids really engaged with it, they really wanted to do it. And the fact that it was designed by kids and influencers, you know, it's made it much easier to use, much more longevity. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled about that. And it's something that I'm very passionate about taking forward is this idea of co-creating interventions as well. So um, to summarize today, we've talked about what fake news is and the negative impact that it can have on us in terms of our behaviors and our beliefs. We've hopefully um, talked about how you can identify fake news and talked about different interventions you might be able to utilize to help young people improve their skills in recognizing fake news. Here is a bunch of links. I'm going to put these, I can put them, maybe Christina, you can put them in the chat um, so that you can explore some of these yourself. Um, different games you might be able to use. So for example, here's the Project Real um, materials at the top, so you can utilize those. There's lots of online games, um, which I've, I've touched on. You can explore those. Uh, the News Literacy Project has a weekly newsletter and has some example lessons. First Draft News, again, weekly newsletter on information. Um, courses on looking to see when media has been distorted, so photos and videos. Um, a debunking handbook, all sorts of different things here. So you can have a little look through some of these materials. Um, all of them should be freely available um, or at least available by sending somebody an email. Um, Project Real is definitely freely available for anybody to use. And that is all the content I wanted to talk through today. I can see there's some questions in the Q&A, so I might move on to those now, um, if that's okay with people and, and have a little look at the chat. Um, so let me just stop sharing so I can see a bit more clearly. Um, right, where's the key A? So maybe I can go through these. If you've got any other questions as we're going along, please um, do feel free to, to put them in and I will try and respond to them. So Holly is saying here, a concern is that individuals are becoming lazy thinkers. Um, how can we get a handle on that level of thinking? Yeah, I mean, I think you're right there that there is an issue with, um, I mean, I think we've always been lazy thinkers. I think we've always used shortcuts. We've always, you know, rumors have always been a thing. You know, there was all sorts of rumors at my school. They just couldn't get online yet. Um, but of course, when you can hit that many people with your your rumors and your fake information, that's when we get a lot of problems. So I think, you know, hopefully some of the suggestions about using that systematic route, giving people techniques so they don't have to use an extra level of thinking to go, how do I find this out? If they've got a little checklist or they've got things they can do, that takes away one level of, of difficulty. Um, and maybe just that sort of awareness of, um, you know, the fact that something might not be true. I know myself, um, you know, at school, rumors went around very quickly and people had no kind of critical evaluation. Like if someone said it, it was clearly true. Um, so hopefully just that sort of awareness that, you know, there are people out there who might not necessarily be telling the truth. Um, and here's some things you could do to spot them. Gamifying, I think, is a nice way to do it. Um, so it's it's less threatening. You know, I think people are quite often embarrassed about being got by fake news. Um, it's seen as like, oh, gosh, you know, I don't want to admit that I believe that when it was silly of me in the same way that when people are, are got um, by uh, you know, when they've sent money to someone online thinking there was someone they weren't, there's a lot of embarrassment and that's why people don't necessarily report it and that's why these people get away with it and they do it with the next person. So I think breaking that down, making it maybe a bit more playful and, you know, talking about what you can do. And, and it was Etienne who said this when we were in a meeting, you know, you can go out into your environment today and if you see trash on the ground in your park, you could pick it up and you can make your environment nicer. And, you know, the internet's like that. You can go on there and you can put all sorts of horrible things and fake news or you can be part of the solution and pointing out things and, and trying to not share it and make it a nicer place for all of us. So I think that's something to really think about is, um, you know, you, you as, a, as an influencer on, on social media, people are trusting you, what you can do to, to make the internet a kind of nicer place there. Um, thanks, Holly. 
I can see a question from Lynn. Um, has any research been done on students who've been victims of false information online to see whether their own experience impacts their ability to identify false information or be more circumspect in their own postings? Uh, Lynn, this is a great question. I don't know that this has been done, um, but I would imagine that, you know, generally when we've been victims of things ourselves, we tend to be a bit more aware of it and how horrible it feels when someone maybe says something about you online or edits a video of you or, you know, things like that. You know, it's just a joke, but of course it's not. It's online bullying sometimes. Um, so I don't know for sure if there have been studies on this, but my my feeling, my inclination would be that kids who experience it would be more likely to be to, to notice it but then also I guess there is the, the possibility you know when someone's done something to you you might want to do it back and create your own accounts and and you know so it could be a revenge thing so I would guess it would maybe make you more aware of it whether that makes you then go on the side of the superheroes or the super villains I'm not too sure but I think that would be something that would be really interesting to explore um, because of course as we've talked about there is a, a power thing with being the first one to find you know the first story or be the one to share it so I think that would be quite an interesting thing to explore with the kids um, is you know if you've experienced something you know how might that feel um, for other people you know um, and that's something we talk about a little bit you know in terms of editing photos like a lot of the kids said yeah I would edit a zit out because I, that's not what I look like all the time so it's fine to do that but I wouldn't edit like my nose because that's that's my actual face you know so there's a lot of discussion in that about lines where it's okay and where it's not uh, Michael I think I talked a little bit about this earlier about the impact of AI in promoting fake news um but yeah the idea that you know they can you can you could say to AI right now you know write an article saying that I don't know, Greta Thunberg has changed her mind and decided that there's no such thing as climate change. And it would write probably a quite scientific looking article um, with quotes. I've done it before and it, you know, I asked it to write something, a summary of a piece of work I'd done it, putting quotes from me as well. And I was like, wow, I didn't say that. Um, so I think that is something that we do need to explore um, is, you know, how easy it is to create things and quite long articles sometimes without a lot of information. Um, so something definitely to look at. Um, so a question here about what you would expect to see across different nations, cultural group, SES factors, age variations among youth, educational attainment, etc. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, um, there's obviously a lot of variety in the different groups we've worked with. We worked with schools in Glasgow just because I'm here, um, but we did have schools from different parts of Glasgow, different areas of Glasgow, um, to try and get that, that diversity as well um, in terms of what the kids would be interested in. I mean, it's interesting because you might expect, for example, that, you know, high attaining children might be quite good at this um, because maybe they're a bit more critical. But there is also the suggestion that kids who like maybe are more, um, you know, trusting of the establishment and of teachers and things like that might then be more likely to be trusting of information they see online and therefore more likely to fall for fake news. So I think there's quite a lot more to be done here. Um, as I was saying, in terms of looking at, at who is believing fake news and, and when and why. Um, in terms of cultural differences or national differences, I don't know anything that's that's really done that. I think most of the work has been done in the UK and the USA so far. Um, but I think there would be interesting things to look at there in terms of, um, you know, who who is believing it or how it's shared or you know, this sort of information. But I don't I can't talk too much about that because it's not something I've seen a huge amount on. But definitely something that I think we need to be exploring more. Um, how do I choose teachers to work on these projects? Is there first a consciousness raising session? Um, so what I do in these um, in these situations is I'm looking. I, I advertise on like there's a, a kind of newsletter for Glasgow schools, and I advertise on that for teachers who were interested in being involved, um, because obviously if you're going to co-create, you're giving your time very generously. So I needed people who would be interested um, and who had the experience of working with children of that age. So for me, that was the, the most important thing was that they had experience with those kids and they had some sort of interest in working with it. Um, that's how I chose the teachers for the co-creation. But in terms of the people who've utilized it afterwards, it's just been, again, they've chosen to do it. We haven't asked anybody to do it directly. You know, they've chosen to do it and then they've chosen to be part of the evaluation, um, which might then mean, of course, that certain people would be more likely to utilize it than others. Um, 
But what I'd really like to get to the stage of doing is where the whole school is kind of doing it. And there's a whole school ethos on, you know, real and fake information and our, all of our responsibilities in exploring them. So that's that's kind of what we're doing there is, is trying to um, make sure that everybody is getting, um, you know, that we have we have the chance to hear from different teachers um, and different perspectives, because that's what co-creation is all about. You don't want to be in an echo chamber. You actually want that diversity but people who are going to have some sort of interest in it themselves. Um, and it was interesting as well because we asked teachers were there any topics they were worried about. And the only one that they said they had some worries about was the conspiracy theory one. Um, so they said that was the one that they were the most concerned about because it obviously can be, you know, people have very strong opinions about conspiracy theories and things like that. But the, the topic itself is very much on what is a conspiracy theory? What are the ingredients of a conspiracy theory? you know, those sorts of questions. So I think that was how we kind of made sure that that was something that teachers were comfortable with. And another question from Michael here, can you discuss the use and implications of social fake news and cyberbullying? Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it obviously is something that you can, you can do now quite easily. You can edit um, someone's voice and make them say something that they haven't said. Incidentally, I now have a, I now have a code word with my mum when I go traveling. Um, so that uh, if she ever hears me calling her and saying, hey, I need you to wire me loads of money if, <laughs> immediately, um, if, they don't, if they don't say that word, then it's not me because there's clearly more than three seconds of my voice on YouTube these days. Um, so that's something that, you know, it is, it is quite easy to do now, um, you know, with tech that is quite available. Obviously, you can edit photos as well to make it look like people are wearing things and, and doing things that they haven't done. So of course that's um, that can be really negative um, because you can create things, and of course that's much more upsetting than just saying Yvonne said. Never mind the fact that when things are cyber, you know, so many people can be seeing, you know, what's happened, uh, what's up there, you know, rather than just you know schoolroom where it's just the kids who are in front of you at the time. So I think there is um, there's things to be considered here. It's obviously a whole new form of bullying, which is terrible. Um, that there are now, you know, more more tools that allow us to bully more effectively. But hopefully by teaching people the skills to do this, people won't just accept it and be like, oh, yeah, everyone said that. They'll maybe take the minute. Maybe they will be part of the solution. Maybe they will be part of the reporting, how to report things, you know, on Twitter, directly to Twitter so they can take things down or to the school and things like that. So hopefully the idea here is empowering people to, to have the skills to allow them to, to stop these things um, rather than upskilling them and making them better at, at, at taking the kind of dark side of this. Uh, Self-esteem and self-efficacy as media, mediators of uh, or protective factors against bullying or buying into fake news or spreading it. Um, yeah, I mean, so typically, you know, we used to think of bullies or children who bully as, you know, the typical kind of Oafish, kind of Nelson from The Simpsons, you know, not terribly intelligent, these sorts of things. But now we know that quite often bullies are quite skilled, socially skilled, or children who bully, I should say, I don't like to use the term bullies, um, quite socially skilled because they understand, you know, what's going to be embarrassing, how to say things, how to, you know, get people on board. So I think it's, um, you know, our view of, you know, people who might bully is, is changing. And obviously Deborah Pepler's work has looked at this quite a lot as well. So if you're interested, you can check out some of her materials. Um, but in terms of self-efficacy, um, I guess it's the self-efficacy of you believing that you can, you know, make a difference. When when we see a bullying situation, we have the bullies, we have the victims, we have the bully, um, the reinforcers, and then we have quite a lot of people who are just bystanders who are just like trying not to see it. And hopefully, if we can empower those people, then that tends to take the the number of people against the bullying over the number of people who are bullying, and therefore it's easier to to try and make change there. So I would suggest that, you know, self-efficacy is what we're trying to get at here is your ability to recognize it. But then you're also your ability to say something in a way that means that you're not then going to become the victim because quite often we're afraid to say something. You know, we might see something online and go, Ooh, I really don't like that. But how do I say it to you in a way that is then not then going to be a photo of me doing these things? So that's another stage of this research that I'd like to do later is looking at what we can do as, um, you know, to help people to come up with tools to to challenge fake news so for example finding that sort of shared um there's some work by people in new zealand on this you know that where you see kind of two different people with very different opinions on something instead of going well you're wrong it's clearly this you try and find something in the middle like oh it's great that you care so much about children i care about them so much too and when i was reading this i found that this could be a real problem for children and so i've tried this 
So there's just different techniques we can use to have a conversation about these things instead of maybe going, you're wrong, you're wrong, and then we bat up bat heads and then nothing changes. So creating kind of more efficacy and you know techniques that people can utilize to help to call out fake news when they see it. Wonderful. Yvonne, I, I have a question for you. Uh, you. You mentioned that uh, both, uh, I think you call it uniqueness, you know, the, as a motivation, the youth wanted to be unique. They wanted to, and, and, and social inclusion, also an important motivation. And, um, and it, it makes me wonder, you know, that those two, those two items in particular are really promoted by the medium itself because it's, it, it's about how quickly you respond, you're bombarded. You know, you belong to several groups at the same time. You're getting messages from several groups. Um, and if you don't do it right away, you're late. It passed. Somebody else is already. So so now my question to you is, so you have here a, a bias built in in the medium itself that conspires against the use of critical skills uh, on the part of the youth or anybody else to do it. And I wonder if you have thought some about that and, and what and, 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 and what can be done about it, or perhaps even integrated into your program and others, because I think that's an, a very important piece. Uh, mm -hmm. their, their attention uh, is to the item at hand, to the community they are responding to and want to be part of, not to the truth. And so I wonder if you have some, th some thoughts about that. Yeah, I mean, that's a really, really good point um, in terms of, you know, yeah, you want to be the first person to share something. Yeah, and so you don't necessarily take the time, right? Because if you don't share now, then someone else has shared it and then you've lost your moment. And then, of course, once you say something and then people like, you know, you get all these likes and hearts. And, you know, if you've seen Wreck-It Ralph wrecks the Internet and you can see all the hearts popping up and that validation. And then that makes you think, OK, I'm going to do more of these maybe slightly nasty things or I'm going to share more of this information because it gets me that validation so I mean I guess you know it's something that the social media platforms could look at you know is there is there a way of slowing things a little bit because obviously we know things can go very negative very quickly as well so you can put something up for a split second and then take it down because you've made a mistake but if someone screenshots it and then puts it up and and suddenly you know boom it's 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 you know it's there forever so I think you're right there's maybe something about calming the pace a little bit but it's very hard to think about how that might be done you know because of the way social media is designed but that's partly what we're asking is just saying to the kids don't just click share take a take a minute and even just that minute is usually enough for people to cool off if they've seen something that's wound them up or you know to to do a little bit of research so I don't have a solution here but I think you are you're definitely right is that that speed is something that we need to in, in all of our lives, just calm down a little bit and, and take a few minutes before we, we take, we respond. And, and, and a follow-up question to that then is, uh, what have you learned or what about the youth um, that the importance on truth for the youth that you're working with? Do they care about the truth? Do they seem, or are they surprised that somebody else wants to talk about it? <laughs> you know what? What 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 was the what is your sense? What did you learn about that? So the, kids, the young people that we worked with, they they did care because they they we talked a lot about you know the problems that you might have. You know, people said that you said something that wasn't true. You know, like that that's something that we can all relate to. You know, someone says to your friend, "Oh, you know, Katie said that you said this." You know, we've all had that happen to us, and it's a horrible feeling. Um, so they they did really care about it very much. When it related to themselves but i don't think they always necessarily made that connection to you know figures out there or information or news about you know like in most things it, it happens in my life first and then as my horizons get bigger i start to look at my community and then i start to look at my you know my country and then you know i start to look at the global level so i wouldn't say the kids that i worked with they definitely cared about it but maybe they saw it as more relevant when it was things that were more about an individual rather than companies or organizations or, or things out there mm -hmm. um 
And so I think that's part of wh why they really enjoyed Project Real because it gave them that voice and that space to explore these things. And, and we didn't go in with knowledge. Yeah, we went with knowledge, but we didn't go in telling them what to do. We said, what matters to you? And that's why if you look at the topics, it's fake photos, fake videos, fake news. You know, it's very much about areas and things that matter to them um, rather than climate change and then this and then that. It was, you know, these ideas first and then they could apply it to different areas of their lives and then hopefully as they become more aware of these things they might apply it to bigger picture things not just my school but my you know community my my global etc fantastic fantastic thank you thank you very much uh uh you want you you have uh, given us so much for us to ponder and to think about and it's it i'm amazed and uh, since the first day i learn about you and your work uh, and began to read it and see the videos. I was, I couldn't believe how little I knew about this this aspect of our life that is being, that is really so important and that is affecting the lives of you know millions of kids and families across the world. So I, I thank you for for the work that you're doing. Uh, remind people in the audience that that the Melissa Institute is is uh, now fully engaged in in an initiative uh, uh, which we call the Social Media Safety and Mental Health Initiative to in part do uh, what uh, Yvonne has been doing, uh, which is to help kids understand the strings that are being pulled and how they've been pulled and how their consciousness and perceptions of the world have been manipulated. Uh, and also we hope to develop ways to help them uh, curate uh, safe digital spaces so that uh, not only are they savvy consumers of the information there, but they actively uh, and intentionally produce uh, content that would be life affirming and would be health promoting for those uh, in their in their world and those and others who, who consume what their messages. And uh, I'm glad to say that that uh, Yvonne has agreed to be part of our team. In doing this, so we, we, we you will be hearing more uh, from her uh, later on. We're excited about it. Uh, thank you again, Yvonne, for for taking the time to to uh, to be with us today. Thank you for sharing this work. Uh, so it's important. Thank you for inviting me, and thank you for all your lovely comments. I can see coming through in the chat here. It's been a real treat to to speak to you, and um, be very happy to hear from you going forward in the future. And 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 uh, remind everybody. Again, that uh, Melissa Institute is, uh, we're going into our 28th year and of giving science away, of giving the best knowledge that we can find the, to help everybody uh, become agents of, uh, uh, of violence prevention and treatment. Uh, everything we do is done for free. And uh, uh, we only ask again that you use the knowledge that you get to make the world a better place for everyone and that uh, you consider donating if your means allow you to do that. Yeah, I want to thank you. We will uh, have another installment of our prevention series, the violence prevention series, uh, next month, Friday the 13th. And uh, we we're going to have uh, our scientific director, um, uh, Don Meikenbaum, uh, giving a wonderful talk about safety, mental health, and resilience in schools. So hope that you can join us then. Uh, until then. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful weekend. And uh, thank you again for joining us from the other side of the world, uh, Yvonne. Thank you.